This week I'm joined once again by writer Sean Fleming to discuss the work of Thomas Hobbes, alongside discussion on Fleming's own book, Leviathan on a Leash, A Theory of State Responsibility. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you would like to support the podcast and keep it going indefinitely, gain access to some exclusive content, or just support it, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Sean Fleming, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thanks for having me, James. Uh, We're going to be discussing uh, sort of two things in a way, but they're both connected. Uh, Your book, Leviathan on a Leash, A Theory of State Responsibility, which was published by Princeton University Press uh, two years ago in 2020, um, which is in relation to Thomas Hobbes' text, Leviathan, which will also be probably the primary... uh, focus of our conversation is really the work of Thomas Hobbes, who most people will know uh, for his book Leviathan and usually little else, and probably only know for a couple of ideas which are put forth in that book. Um, So really, I would open up this conversation by saying, one, who is Thomas Hobbes? And two, you know, how did your book come about? Because I would say Thomas Hobbes isn't exactly fashionable these days. Okay, well, first, who is Thomas Hobbes? He is probably the most famous English political philosopher. He wrote during the English Civil War, uh, his most famous book, uh, Leviathan, which is the one that I draw from most, was published in 1651. And overall, it's an impassioned plea for order in the midst of civil war. So Hobbes was on the royalist side in the English Civil War. He was calling for for the people of England to support the monarchy against the parliamentarians who were in the midst of an insurrection. So how did my book come about? Well, this is a sort of long winding story, but it came about from an attempt to understand a problem that on the face of it has little to do with Hobbes the problem of state responsibility. So the basic question that I try to answer in my book is, how can a state owe money? How can it have debts? How can it be punished? How is it possible for an abstraction, like a state, like England, or like Canada, or like Russia, to have debts and obligations? And through a roundabout route, I found a compelling answer to that question in mm-hmm. Hobbes' Leviathan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so one, one thing I mean, I mean really to lay the foundation for both Hobbes' theory and this conversation is Hobbes uh, within the Leviathan begins really with making sure that definitions are strict. Uh, and this is, as you make clear really against the scholasticism of the day i mean he's beginning by saying look if we're going to discuss these things the state uh, government subjects uh monarchy we need really strict definitions right and what, what it, outside of probably the, the obvious importance of knowing where you're going what, what why is this so important for, for hobbes well he insists on clear definitions in part because his model for philosophy is geometry He looks at the certainty of geometry and takes that as an ideal model for thinking about the social world. And of course, geometry starts with clear definitions. You define your premises and then you draw inferences from them. And this is Hobbes' style. So in part, his insistence on definitions is just a, a sort of aesthetic preference about how philosophy should be done. But it runs much deeper than that. And it has a, a political overlay. He thinks that clear definitions are necessary, and this is no exaggeration, to keep us from killing each other. Why do we fight? Well, it's because we disagree about what constitutes justice and what constitutes the good. We all have a slightly different idea about what constitutes a just world. And if we all act on our own definition of what justice is, then we're bound to fight. So Hobbes argues what we need is someone to impose order on this anarchy of meanings, this anarchy of definitions. And so we need an absolute sovereign to define what justice means. Mm -hmm. And so monarchy is 
for Hobbes basically superior. Yes, that's right. Why and is this? Why is this? The reason is that he thinks it's more stable. So the, there are several versions of this argument. and There are several uh, sort of side arguments here, but the general thrust of it is this. A monarch can't disagree with himself, but an assembly can. An assembly can have multiple factions and these factions can spill beyond the assembly and become factions in a civil war. This is what happened during the English Civil War. He thinks that parliamentary democracy is dangerously close to civil war at all times. And so in order to have any stable order, it's best to vest sovereignty in one individual. Now, he does think that, that a legitimate sovereign can be an assembly. He thinks it's better to have an absolute assembly than to have no sovereign at all, of course. But if you have a choice, it's better to have a monarch. Do you just just on an I guess on a little digression, would Hobbes or do you think that it's even possible now, uh, after you know many many years of sort of um, the the dem- democratic push, though that's resulted in something I'd argue that we don't no one really knows what is. Um, do you think it's possible to actually go back to a monarchy after the after the I guess after the French Revolution is really what we dis- would say. I don't think it's possible. I certainly don't think it's desirable. And I don't think Hobbes, if he were in our shoes, would be in favor of, well, a forced return to monarchy. No. I think he would accept the legitimacy of parliaments and assemblies, but just try to ensure that they're as absolute as possible. He would be against attempts to divide power among different branches of government. He would be a friend of parliamentary sovereignty if he were alive today. So the so the the focus really for Hobbes is is a for stability of of is it specifically, you know, can we begin to differentiate power and government? You know, is it is it stability of power or is it stability of the state? Are they two different things? You know, because once, for instance, I mean, just to expand on that, I would say that maybe maybe you'll agree or disagree that that the power in relation to how this how our state is run. A lot of that power is actually found within corporations. It's just found within within things which really aren't anything to do with the state, right? So is it to do with stability of power or stability of the state for Hobbes? Well, Hobbes, I don't think, would accept that distinction at all. And there's a, a large chunk of Leviathan where he's talking about corporations. <laughs> and he thinks it's a terrible idea to have corporations which are separate from the state. They should always be on a leash. They should always be appendages of the state. And of course, Hobbes was taking for granted here that corporations needed to be chartered by the state. They could only operate in Hobbes's time if they had legislation that defined precisely what they were allowed to do. So Hobbes is looking here at, at the huge imperial corporations like the Virginia Company. And he's seeing that they're becoming increasingly wealthy and powerful. And they're also hotbeds of, of uh, parliamentarian activity. He's, he sees this in the run-up to the Civil War and sees that these corporations are fomenting dissent. Mm-hmm. And so Hobbes would say all power should be centralized in the state. If you have these little mini states, and think of our modern tech companies, <laughs> that now have GDPs larger than many states, if you allow these at all, they will inevitably proliferate and challenge the state. So just as you shouldn't have two parliaments, you shouldn't have a state alongside many other pseudo states that can potentially challenge its power. So Hobbes gives us a vision here of, of, well, the, the path not taken where we don't allow corporations to have any independence. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so is there, I mean, I sort of see this question as tangentially connected. Is there even such a thing as democracy? Is that actually a possibility in the way that we, we conceptualize it for Hobbes? Well, at some level, I suppose you could say Hobbes's vision of sovereignty is democratic. Mm-hmm. 
or at least superficially so. He thinks that a legitimate sovereign is one who is authorized by all of the people. Now, he has a rather odd conception of what constitutes authorization, but nonetheless, the, the people are in there. So the, the difference between our conception of, of authorization and Hobbes's is essentially that Hobbes thinks that when you authorize a sovereign, you don't get to decide what, to withdraw that authorization later. Once you've authorized a monarch, you don't get to vote again in a few years. You've given up your rights to the sovereign. Mm. That's true of an assembly as well. So imagine, imagine a, a state of affairs where we authorize parliamentarians, and then they get to decide whether we get to vote again. Mm. That's Hobbesian sovereignty. Authorization is a one-off for Hobbes. It's not a, an iterated process. You know, it's a marriage, not a library book. Is one analogy we could use. And how would he view people who, you know, individuals who seek solely just to opt out of all of that, who who care for no authorization? Well, he does allow for that. He says, when we all get together and decide to authorize a sovereign. It's up to you whether to come along with us. But if you don't authorize the sovereign along with everyone else, then you remain in the state of nature. And anyone is allowed to kill you without injustice. <laughs> I mean, that, is, is it really that severe for Hobbes? Well, at least the rhetoric is that severe. Mm. There's no practical option to remain in the state of nature. You're inevitably dragged along. So but, it seems, seems like he's conflating anarchism and the state of nature. Well, the state of nature, I don't think is as anarchic as it sounds, it, or at least not anarchic in the anarchist sense. So it, maybe we should talk about what the state of nature is. Uh, so the, the famous phrase that's often quoted to describe Hobbes's state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This is his description of life in the state of nature. And when you read the, the chapter of Leviathan on the state of nature, you get the impression that he's describing some historical condition from which our current political situation emerged, that we were all once, you know, wandering around the forest, whacking each other over the head with clubs. But this is not really what the state of nature is. It's not so much a historical condition as an ever-present possibility. It's a, it's a dramatized description of civil war. It's not really a war of all against all, to use that other oft-quoted phrase. It's a, a war of factions that tears apart the society. This is what the state of nature is. So really, for Hobbes, the ultimate task is to constantly keep that at bay. That's exactly right. That maintaining order is the task of the state. Justice is secondary. Justice doesn't even have a meaning until you have someone, some sovereign who can define it. Mm -hmm. Order is the basic precondition for any kind of politics. So how then, how then is the individual, I mean, I guess I'm speaking of in a, in a very modern tongue, but how is the individual, the, you know, I guess the individual subject not just entirely lost within this uh, national or state uh, whole, you know? Well, in, in some way that the individual is lost within the whole. There's this passage in Leviathan where Hobbes says that when the multitude of individuals authorize a single representative, a sovereign, they literally become one person. He says there's a real unity of all of them. And on the face of it, this looks like the height of collectivism. But there's an enormous caveat here, that this unity is made only for the purpose of self-preservation, for the purpose of preserving the lives of all these individuals. So whenever the sovereign comes to threaten the lives of these individuals, they can fight back. If the sovereign sends out his men to kill you, well, the whole purpose of this covenant 
that you signed is to protect your own life. So you can't be expected not to fight back. So there's a limit to the unity, self-preservation, individual self-preservation marks the limit to how far sovereignty goes for Hobbes. But there's also another facet to this. So when you read Hobbes with modern eyes, you get the impression that he's in favor of some kind of totalitarianism. This absolute sovereignty looks totalitarian, but it didn't to Hobbes. It, he's operating under the assumption that the means of the state are actually very limited. You know, you might give up all your rights to the sovereign, but the sovereign can't control your life, can't micromanage your life with carrier pigeons and soldiers on horseback. So in Hobbes's time, totalitarianism wasn't technologically possible. And so his assumption is that, that the the scales naturally tip toward liberty rather than order. And he's just trying to put his finger on the scale the other way. And Hobbes might, might have revised his views significantly, uh, given how powerful states naturally are mm. with modern technology. Well, I guess, I mean, we, we've, we've touched on it, but it's such an ambiguity, I guess, uh, which is which is really, I guess, the importance back to that question of definitions. And it's really almost the purpose of your book. I mean, I almost want to reiterate the question again, because we're talking about this thing. We're talking about this thing called the state and all of a, all of a, red, all of a sudden in our own language, it's become this sort of uh, uh, being of its own. Right. Oh, the state. Oh, OK, well, what what is that, you know, defined? What is the state? <laughs> well, I guess we'd have to differentiate between Hobbes's time and our own because now, now has it become a bit looser? Well, I, I think when Hobbes means the state, he means the same sort of thing that we do. This is one of the things that hasn't changed much since Hobbes's time. The idea of an abstract state that is separate on one hand from the individual people and separate on the other hand from the government. Hmm. So this concept of the state is early modern in origin and emerged around Hobbes's time. And Hobbes is interesting because he is the one who states it most clearly, pun intended. Uh, so just think about, think about the way we, we, well, let's think of a concrete problem here, sovereign debt. Governments come and go. So you know, there are elections every few years, the government gets tossed out. That doesn't affect the state's debt. Mm. So Britain doesn't owe less money whenever a minister dies. And on the other side, it doesn't owe less money whenever a citizen dies. So that debt attaches to some, to some abstract thing that is neither the individual citizens nor the people who actually exercise power, the government. Mm. There, the assumption behind something like sovereign debt or a treaty obligation that lasts over long periods of time is that it's the state, this abstract thing, this inhuman thing in the middle that has the obligation. But I mean, I, I would argue that that seems like a democratic problem, right? It's because, you know, specifically in democracies, they can basically do this thing where um, if things go bad, the people in the people in power can say, well, you know, it was dem democratically voted. This is what you voted for. It's the people's fault. And if things go well, then it's the people in charge's success, right? So either way, democracy always wins because they always have that get out clause of like, clause of, it's like Brexit, right? Well, this is how democracy works. It's like, it's gone bad, but if it had gone really, really well, I don't really, it hasn't really gone any way at all, right? Because I don't know, we might be at the end of history, but it turns out it's just really boring. Um, but and nothing really happens. But like, you know, it, let's say, for instance, if Brexit went really, really well, it's like, oh, you know, well done, conservative government or well done, UKIP or whatever. If it went really, really bad, well, you, the people voted for it. So and what I mean by that is when you're talking about debt, when you're talking about obligations in relation to a monarchy of, right, you have this one person who is the, the absolute uh, leader of all of the state. In a sense, they can't avoid responsibility. Whereas in a in a democracy, it can it sort of filters out into this just thousandfold uh, 
bureaucratical nonsense and just gets lost, right? I, I think you're right that the lines of accountability are a lot more blurry in mm. democracies. But I do think the same abstraction of the state is present in monarchies. So when the monarch dies, the debt doesn't disappear. Mm. The state still owes the money. Mm. The heir to the throne is now the one who, who has to deal with it. So even in a monarchy, the debt does not attach to the person of the monarch. It attaches to the person of the state. Well, I guess one one thing that we've revolving around though is, I mean, what happened? What would happen to a state if um, the possibility of credit was actually removed? If we, I mean, you know, lo and behold, I sort of want this to happen. But if we went back to a time when usury was taken seriously, you know, it was considered absolutely you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, would state would modern states even be able to function if we said right? You can't do credit anymore. Nothing's on credit. Well, I, don't I, think, I, I don't think anything would be able to function. <laughs> I, I don't think it, it would either. And I think Hobbes foresaw this. And control over money is one of the things that he insists should be in the state's hands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why, is recog- that? Why, why, why the state and not corporations then for Hobbes? Well, for Hobbes, Corporations are appendages of the state. Mm. It, so it, there, there isn't much of a difference there for him. But he recognized that raising an army in particular required the ability to issue and, if necessary, manipulate money. Mm. Okay, well, there's an interesting question there with regards to the modern day and where we find, where we find the actual state. Because, of course, you know, um, as we've been talking about, we say, we say the state and... Um, we know what it is, but we don't know what it is, right? It's like, well, we can all talk about it, but it's hard to go. That That's the state. It's over there. That's it there. So today, I mean, for instance, I would maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but to a certain degree, you could, especially in the Western world, you could say, well, to a certain degree, Amazon is the state because it holds so much power and it holds so much possibility for disorder that you would be wrong in neglecting that from the state, same with a mass of corporations, which now provide our basic needs. I mean, the privatization of energy is basically uh, a state apparatus, even though it's not directly connected to the state. So it seems the whole thing has been reversed, where the state doesn't hold the power to say, we, we, we tell you what you can and can't do. Uh, those private corporations, are, even though they're paying taxes, the state is really beholden to the corporations. Yeah, I think that's right. And Hobbes would have been absolutely horrified by that. <laughs> and his, I would, I would guess that he would argue for a, a new system of corporate charters. Mm. The state should give an ultimatum to the corporations. Either you accept, well, bespoke corporate charters that restrict you, maybe even l- limit the number of years you're allowed to operate, limit the domains in which you can operate, essentially become appendages of the state or die. Well, and if they it, became it, appendages of the state, they'd die anyway. But there is there is a scary version of this, though. There's a mm. scary, uh, maybe, I'm not sure what adjective to put on it, other than the Chinese version of this. So Hobbes should be careful what he wishes for. Because we do have an example of what it looks like when the corporations merge with the state. Mm. That is China. They are appendages of the state. It doesn't make them any less scary, actually. It just makes the state more scary. Mm. Hmm. But Hobbes is is interesting on the question of corporations because he has so much foresight. What would he What would he define our? Uh, I guess I'll just speak of the UK or America. What, what would he define this system as? You know, it's clearly not really a democracy in that sense, considering the the power corporations have. Well, that's a good question. I I think he would see it as an aristocracy. Mm. He would see it as a kind of aristocracy, an aristocracy in which there are periodic elections, mm. but an aristocracy nonetheless, and. If we take seriously the idea that parliament is sovereign in the UK, mm. 
then of course it must be an aristocracy. If it were a democracy, then the people would be sovereign. But if, if it's parliament that's sovereign, then it's an assembly that is some subset of the people, which by definition is an aristocracy. It's not a monarchy. That's obviously mm. uh, just a, a legacy of some past time. The monarch doesn't actually wield the ultimate decision-making authority. It's formally a monarchy, but in effect, the UK seems to be an aristocracy. Mm -hmm. So did you, I mean, so when was, when was Leviathan written? Written, that's off pub, the top of my pub, head. Pub, published then, is it? Published is 1651, it came out. Okay, so sort of the, you know, capitalism hasn't come in, in quite into full swing yet, but he's foreseeing this, because I think that's a huge change in basically everything is the way that capitalism is subsuming everything, right? So... You know, well, did he foresee this with his discussions on corporations? I'm not sure that that he foresaw modern capitalism. I think he was thinking of corporations in a more political way than mm. we're accustomed to. He saw corporations as more politically than economically dangerous. And one of the things that's worth noting here is that he sat on the board of the Virginia Company. Mm -hmm. And he he saw what was going on in North America at the time. He had a, a front row seat to the colonization of North America. He was well aware of that. And so he foresaw at, at least the imperial trade of the next few centuries, mm -hmm. if not the development of capitalism as we currently know it. Mm -hmm. He certainly foresaw imperialism. And he foresaw that it could enrich corporations to the point where they could challenge the state. Hmm. So I guess a big question would be, you know, would he consider where we're at as some something gone wrong? Or, or would he say, well, you seem to be doing fairly well in terms of order? Um, you know, where would he where might he say, well, you should probably do this now? Or are we a bit too far removed from his own time to be able to sort of say what he might might? Uh, address. I've suggested that he wouldn't like the aggrandizement of corporations mm. in our society, but I think you are right that he would admire the degree of order that we have. You know, it, if you look at the rates of violence in our societies, they're astoundingly low compared to past societies. If self-preservation is the goal, then we seem to be doing pretty well. Mm. The, I suppose the, the wrench in the gears here is the possibility that a nuclear war or some other catastrophic event could, could be the, the fat tails scenario that upends all this. You know, we live in a society in which almost perfect order is the norm. Now, some people would object to that description of it, but compared to past societies, that is the case. But with the outlying threat, of total destruction of everything. And I'm not sure how Hobbes would grapple with this. This, this wasn't something that, that was conceivable in his time. Existential risk is really the, the, the difficulty for the Hobbesian analysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, one thing that we're really seeing here is that throughout time, the state has changed. And I mean, this, this seems to be, once you remove uh, once you remove the sort of monarchical, very clear, uh, strict, singular leader, the the notion of change in terms of the state altering itself into something else becomes uh, increasingly more fluid and fluid to the point where we're at the moment where we, as you say, it's quite difficult to even define what we're in. You know, when you're when you're in a monarchy and you say, look, this Stuart or whoever is is the ruler of X place. It's fairly easy to understand that. But at the moment, things can change. And yet the state, whatever that is, quote unquote, uh, retain, you know, remains the state. And we don't really question that. Um, so how how is it able to retain this fluid identity, which we still all sort of cling to? I suppose what's happening is that we're we've retained the concept of the state, even though we're less and less sure about where sovereignty lies. 
we still have government. We still have administration. We still have the exercise of some kind of hierarchical power. But whereas Hobbes was absolutely sure about where sovereignty lies, as we've already alluded to, it's less and less clear where sovereignty lies in our societies. Is it parliament that's sovereign? Is it the people who are sovereign? Is it the queen who's sovereign? We don't really seem to know anymore. And maybe it doesn't matter in the end. Maybe sovereignty is kind of dead in our societies. We have more and more power, but it's less and less centralized. Mm. But that's, that's sort of worrying. I mean, just to go off on probably a tangent, which we both, uh, I know, are very uh, big on. But, the, you know, the idea of, I mean, one of the ideas that sort of what, what many people might call neoliberal capitalism or consumerism, etc., bolsters is this idea of individual sovereignty. But really what that individual sovereignty amounts to is a, an extremely condensed version of personal sovereignty, where really you're just given a few factors um you know one one is obviously consumption but of course that's even that's getting more and more and more limited as well so this actual notion of sovereignty in terms of sort of being in terms of lifestyle in terms of the bigger notions of what's happening on a grander scale that seems to be getting lost to an abstraction which is almost eating itself like like it's almost worrying that you go to the sovereign and they don't even know where the power lies right it's this this uh, what we were talking about earlier where the you know, responsibility being pushed over layers and layers and layers mm -hmm. of subcommittees, etc. Eventually, you get to this point where it's almost like no one knows who should be doing a job. And in that case, the, the purpose of the job is just completely lost. And the power itself, you almost have no, you have no power over the power. <laughs> and here you're gesturing at Jacques Ellul. <laughs> and this was one of Ellul's worries about the modern world, that we have blurred the lines of accountability to the point where no one is responsible for anything. And one of the benefits of having a very Hobbesian hierarchical state with a central node from which everything else flows is that you always know who to blame. Now in Hobbes's view, you can't blame. You've given up all your rights to the sovereign. The sovereign is unaccountable for a different reason. But at least in principle, you could have somewhere to point a finger. But in our world, you never do. And you see this in the most egregious case, in my view, with sovereign debt. If you look at, you look at the way that, that bond markets work, lots of absolutely atrocious regimes can borrow billions and billions of dollars, use it to fund their patronage networks, use it to buy billions of dollars worth of weapons, villas in France, and then these dictators just die and leave the population with the bill. Now, they borrow money in the name of the state, but they use it for private reasons. It's the ultimate responsibility laundering machine. That's what the modern state has become. So you're saying taxation is theft? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that sovereign debt is a, a very, in many cases anyway, a clever trick mm. that unscrupulous people use to enrich themselves mm. at the expense of the public. What do you think Hobbes would make of, you know, just on that, that angle, what do you think he would make of libertarianism, you know, and the market as the place where order is uh, decided, the market as sovereign, basically? Hobbes wouldn't like this idea at all he would see the potential for private actors to accumulate large amounts of money as politically dangerous above all else. Hobbes is not hostile to markets. The reason that he wants order is so that people can quietly enjoy their goods and peaceful liberty. You know, sitting around on your farm, you know, enjoying your you know, hand-picked corn and having a nice dinner with your family is Hobbes' idea of liberty. And the liberty to trade, he would probably see as relatively important. But the liberty to accumulate large amounts of money that might be used to rival the state is something that he would want to quash. So it seems, it seems in a certain sense with regards to this, this thing that we all uphold, and this is probably getting a bit 
in the modern days getting a bit more turbulent in in relation to it. it, it for Hobbes, this is really a fiction, right? We we uphold something. Um, it, may, it might even pay to bring in God here because it seems that I mean, for instance, to take a modern example, I mean Bruno Latour's book of uh, the, to do with to do with modern, and for some reason the title has completely slipped my mind even though i did a talk on it uh in relation that he he says that you know our our modern gods are basically these signifiers such as capital n nature money um you know these sorts of things uh really these are these are our gods but we don't really know what they mean so in this sense the state becomes this sort of fiction where even in moments of complete disorder it's like well it's fine because it's the state so it'll sort it out because it is the state so it it almost avoids questioning at all times, and at what I guess at what point does that fiction completely just break? You know, at what point? At a certain point, you have to go, okay, this this isn't working anymore. We we at a certain point, you have to admit the state is no longer the state because something's broken, right? Well, okay, let's let's take the point about gods first. Hobbes actually describes the state as a mortal god. This was a dangerous thing to say in his time, and he was often accused of being an atheist. Uh, that's another discussion. But he does deify the state. He wants people to have absolute reverence for it. He wants to encourage that deification of the fiction. And the next question is, when does the deified fiction become profaned? When does it start to fall apart? Well, it starts to fall apart in Hobbes's view when the sovereign no longer protects the subjects. The fiction holds up as long as the sovereign, who's acting in the name of the state, can actually exercise force and protect you from invading armies and from marauders within the gates. And when the, the bargain no longer holds up, and you no longer get the self-preservation that is the aim of the covenant in the first place. That's when the fiction falls apart. Civil war is the limiting case. When there's a civil war, the fiction is broken down. Just like when there's hyperinflation, the fiction of money is broken down. So how do you, why do you think it is that these fictions manage to sort of come back then? Come back. Where have they gone? No, I guess they're still there, yeah. <laughs> it's it's amazing how stable our fictions have been since Hobbes' time. And what's amazing about reading Hobbes is that some some of the things that he takes for granted are not at all obvious to us. The idea that corporations have to be chartered by the state is one. The idea that every play, every theater production had to be authorized and approved by the state is another. There are some really odd things in there that, that we would, would, would balk at or would see as odd. But there are lots of others that are just so familiar, so obvious, and the state is, is the big one. And I think going back to the origins of the modern state is useful to help us understand our own politics. And how does it help us understand our, our our own politics? Why should we Why should we perhaps begin to look at Hobbes again? Well, I think he he shows us the moves that we've make it, made without thinking about it. He shows us multiple different ways of understanding ideas like personhood and authorization, and especially political representation. So he. He gives us alternative ways of using the concepts that we've become so familiar with. It allows us to set modern politics at a distance by looking at it from the past. It's familiar enough to be useful and different enough to give us some perspective that we wouldn't have otherwise. And political representation is, is I think, the most important one. So let me just illustrate this. So, in contemporary politics, we take for granted that representation means resemblance. For an assembly to represent the people, 
is for the assembly to be a microcosm of the people, to be a representative sample of the people in, in the sense that a scientist would use that term. So you often hear uh, claims that parliament doesn't represent Britain because it doesn't include so many women, so many ethnic minorities, so many people who aren't from Oxbridge, you get the idea. But Hobbes uses a totally different metaphor for representation. So for Hobbes, representation doesn't mean resemblance. He's using a metaphor from the theater or the courtroom instead. So think, of, think about when a lawyer represents a client. The lawyer doesn't have to resemble the client. The lawyer just has to be authorized. And in the same way, Hobbes argues, you don't need a parliament to represent the people. A king can represent the people, provided that he is authorized. So he gives you a totally different vision of what representation could mean. And it's one that's been lost through the ages. Now, there are problems with this conception of representation, too. The point is not that Hobbes gives us the right one. But he gives us one that's different enough to give us some critical distance from modern politics. Where, where do you think, just out of interest, where do you think he would be unhelpful to, if we were to utilize him more today? I think the state of nature and human nature are the ideas from Hobbes that get all too much attention and are not really very interesting or helpful. These are the most dramatic parts of Hobbes. They're the sort of attention magnets but it's the ideas of personhood, authorization, and representation that I think are really valuable today. So you think, we have, we have, you think even though it's, it's implied a lot, spe specifically in relation to those things you mentioned, you know, human nature, the war of all against all, this sort of violent nature outside, outside of uh, the state, even though <clears throat> that's our focus on Hobbes, we haven't really left him, we haven't really left him behind all that much. No, he's everywhere. He, he rears his head all over the place. Every time you hear about a social contract or political representation or authorization or sovereign debt or any of these things, Hobbes is just around the corner. He's just beneath the surface. We've inherited a lot of ideas from Hobbes without realizing that they are Hobbesian. Hmm. So where do where I mean we've probably already touched on this in relation to those big those big things. Do you think that's where people primarily get Hobbes wrong? They sort of take you know Le Leviathan, you know that the the famous cover image of the the um, the ruler, right? And this idea of war of all against all. They sort of misconstrue Hobbes in this sense of a sort of a tot as you say a totalitarian, uh, almost like a fascist figure, whereas really. The, the reason for all of that sort of aesthetics in a way, not that he was, I think, I think there is quite a big story behind that original cover plate of the book, but um, it's really a sort of, I don't want to say a panic, but a, you know, as you say, an X risk in relation to, in, in relation to order, you know, how turbulent this thing is that we're trying to uphold so that people can just enjoy the very simple thing of just sitting with your family, right? Like that, reality of a very quiet life where you're picking your farm is beholden to something very something that's trembling right we need to hold on to it yeah Hobbes reminds us that that our peaceful liberty is ultimately backed up by force i think we need a reminder of that every once in a while but the the sort of cartoon Hobbes that you get the fascist totalitarian Hobbes on one side and the supporting this, the, the Hobbes who thinks human nature is evil on the other side are both wrong. Well, it's worth pointing out here that Hobbes doesn't think human beings are by nature evil. He thinks they're by nature self-interested, but he doesn't think they're naturally predatory. He thinks there are a few people who are predatory, and this is why we all need to be scared of each other. But on the whole, he thinks human beings are just self-interested. His scathing indictment of human nature is not as scathing as it first appears. He's not an optimist about human nature, but he doesn't think human beings are devils either. So perhaps he sort of 
would have admiration for the 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 original form of capitalism in relation to the sort of the you know the Adam Smith vision of the butcher bakes sorry the the baker bakes bread not because he wants people to eat the bread but because because he's self-interested right and it doesn't work any other way do you, th- do you think he would have maybe come to have quite a lot of sympathies for that original form of capitalism which hasn't I think the classic we could call it almost classical capitalism even though people would argue that it never changes but I think there's a clear difference between what Adam Smith was on about compared to this extremely plastic thing <laughs> we've currently got yeah, I, I think Hobbes might have been sympathetic to a market society. Mm. As long as it's the baker, not an enormous bakery corporation that comes to rival the state, I think he'd be totally fine with that. that that's quiet enjoyment of liberty. Do you, so do you think the reason that he's, even though he, so it's, it's quite a sort of a strange paradox, right? Is it in that, in that, Hobbes isn't forgotten. Like every, it's on, it's on the tip of everyone's tongue, and it's in the back of everyone's minds, right? So, like, okay, Hobbes, social contract, the origin really of modern political social theory. But he's, but he is forgotten in the sense of, but we've moved beyond that. Quick reference to Hobbes, then we'll get to the modern stuff. It's all fine. We've gone beyond these silly notions of war of all against all and the state of nature, etc. Do you think the reason that he's sort of not forgotten but ignorantly shoved aside is because he is misconstrued in that way of? this basically sort of warmongering totalitarian. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we, we end up reading Hobbesian ideas secondhand without realizing it. You know, we read Rousseau, we read Carl Schmitt, we read Locke. You know, we often get either uh, an actually totalitarian version of Hobbes and Rousseau or Carl Schmitt or the diet version of Hobbes and Locke without going back to the original. And I think Hobbes is worth reading in his own right and gives you a lot of insight into a lot of these later thinkers and where they've gone wrong. Mm. I normally ask, you know, where do, where do we find his influence today? But I would say that, do you think there's anywhere we, we don't in relation to political thought? Is there anyone who really did something completely different? Hmm. Well, from Hobbes to John Rawls, we've been operating with some idea of a contract or covenant as the foundation of modern politics. And even in the sort of dissident traditions, like Carl Schmidt, I've just mentioned, you still have a fundamentally Hobbesian idea at the core of it, which is that some power of decision uh, in a sovereign is the core of politics. So either you have one side of Hobbes, the absolute power of decision, or you have the other side of Hobbes, the contract Mm. as the the foundation of politics. There's very little contemporary political theory that doesn't have one of those things. And even even the primitivist tradition, even people like Kaczynski and Zerzan and so on, they're operating with the idea of the state of nature just in the background. And there, what they're doing is picking up on a, uh, a Rousseauian strand of the, the ultimately Hobbesian tradition and running with it. Mm. So no matter where you go in contemporary political theory, you find threads of Hobbes. So, um, we, yeah, I mean, much like the last conversation we had, we tackled all these big questions very quickly. I mean, is there anything you'd like to add about your own book, which you feel? I mean, we haven't specifically spent a lot of time with your own book in, in relation to this theory of state responsibility. But where does this end up in your book, I guess? You know, taking, you know, going back to Hobbes, digging into state responsibility, where, what really is the problem of state responsibility today, if, uh, you know, as the conclusion of your book? Well, I think the biggest problem today is to figure out where technology fits in all this. <laughs> so who is responsible when an autonomous weapon goes rogue and kills civilians? Who is responsible when a driverless car uh, goes haywire and runs someone over? These are the sorts of questions I think that require a bit more thinking to fit into our current frameworks. It's not totally obvious how sovereign debt works when it's not human beings who are 
issuing the debt contracts, but but bots or automated systems. It's not totally obvious what happens when states make sort of micro treaties issued by computers. Yeah. This is the part that I try to fill in at the end of the book. What happens to this Hobbesian conception of the state that we are still stuck with when technology starts to disrupt it? Mm -hmm. Do you, do you come to any conclusions regarding these things or is it fairly open-ended? The question's still to be answered. I think a lot of the questions are still to be answered, but I, I do my best to try to fit things like autonomous weapons into the framework of the Hobbesian state. And I think as a stopgap measure, we can think of them as political representatives. Now, uh, an autonomous weapon, in some, in some sense, represents the state that deploys it, just as a soldier does. We have to think of, of these technologies as genuine agents, rather than as passive instruments wielded by individuals. And here we get back to some of our previous discussion about Jacques Ellul. Mm -hmm. I think we have to begin to contemplate technology as genuinely autonomous in order to make, make sense of where it fits in modern politics. Okay, okay. Well, um, just to keep the conversation within the bounds of Hobbes, I mean, is there anything else you'd like to add about Hobbes or your own book that uh, you feel we haven't, we haven't touched on? Oh, I think we've done well. Okay. Um, your book can be found on Amazon and also Princeton University Press website, Leviathan on a Leash, a Theory of State Responsibility. And uh, uh, did you mention your latest book project last time, or is that something you're, you're keeping? I did um, mention it last time, yeah. So um, I'm so still writing, still chugging away. I'm writing another book about anti-tech radicalism that focuses on uh, Jacques Ellul and the Unabomber. So I've changed course quite a bit. So stay tuned for that in, in the new year. Okay, well, seems like a good place to finish up then. Sean Fleming, thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me again, James.